Welcome back to the Healthy Skin Coach Show. I'm your host, Takashi, helping you get clear skin and preaching to the world why food is the ultimate medicine. Today, I have a special guest with me. Her name is Hilary Boynton, and she is a certified holistic health counselor and the author of the Heal Your Gut Cookbook. Thank you for joining the podcast. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. And could you share how you uh, were inspired to create your cookbook and what inspired you to become a nutritionist? Well, I've always been interested in nutrition, um, but ironically, in high school, I fell for the whole fat-free thing and thought that that was the answer and wanted to design my own major of nutrition and fitness. And, and then I had my, my first wake-up call when I was like all of a sudden 26 and couldn't have babies and was miscarrying for four miscarriages over the course of three years. And so I was kind of like, what is going on and why am I not able to handle a baby? And I had also had bad skin growing up and had been on Accutane twice and you, you know, also not like cystic terrible stuff, but just always something, you know, it's just, it really bothered me. And so, and then of course I went fat free and that didn't help anything for Accutane is basically vitamin A, which is fat soluble. So then to not be eating any fat was probably not doing much for me. So, um, and then I ended up having triplets through in vitro. And so I was thrown into motherhood and um, outnumbered right away and just, you know, but I realized all of a sudden that I was uh, responsible for three little humans and wanted to feed them well. So then I kind of switched to organic and if it's an organic, then I thought, then it's definitely healthy, even if it was a packaged processed item, I just thought organic was everything. And then I decided to have another baby and thought I would have to go back to in vitro. I wanted to see what it was like to have one baby. And boom, I got pregnant on my own. So looking back to, I realized stress was a huge factor in the whole thing as well. And I think that's one of the number one causes of disease in general. But I ended up having this one baby and the triplets were three. And then I had this baby and he at two months old just broke out in severe eczema head to toe. And so um, I was actually just telling my daughter about the podcast that I'm coming on and she's like, well, you know, like, is there itching all the time? Is it like all the time? Is there ever a let up or like in the middle of the night? And I'm like, I used to have to pin my baby to my body and like hold his arms and legs down so he couldn't scratch himself and just like try and get him to go back to sleep. So it was then that I was searching for answers and every doctor just said, you know, here's the steroid cream, here's the Zyrtec and did all the allergy tests and you know, trying to say, don't eat, like I was breastfeeding. So I was like, I couldn't eat anything and nothing really helped when I would put the steroid cream on. And then I would like forget for a day, it would just flare. Like it would, it was like a band aid. It was so clear to me that it was a band aid. And then, um, ironically, I was trying to change the school lunches in my town in Massachusetts. And this woman that I was working with had healed her son of asthma. And she said, you've got to get him on raw milk. I was like, what is raw milk? I had no idea. So I, but at that point I was desperate and I put him on raw milk and cod liver oil and he was like within two months completely healed. And then every doctor had said, oh, well, you know, he could outgrow it or this could just be his lot in life. He might have asthma, allergies and eczema. They sort of run hand in hand. And at that point, my, I had that aha moment where I was like, holy, you know what? Like real food just healed my child when every doctor said, you know, that wouldn't be the case. And then I just, you know, then we have a daughter with epilepsy. And so I was always then on a quest to try and heal her. And that's where I really got into healing the gut. We had a um, medical intuitive say that basically our whole family could use some gut healing. And so that's when I, and I had knew about, um, I had known about Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride and through the Weston A. Price Foundation and had seen her speak and was a little overwhelmed by her diet protocol because it's a two-year gut healing protocol and I but I dove in and there just was really nothing super inspiring about it like it there was no the inner I mean there were food bloggers but there was nobody really doing much on it and I couldn't find anything beautiful or it just was like I'm a very visual person so and at that point I was teaching cooking classes out of my home and a woman in my class was also on the GAPS diet and she was a photographer. So we were like, we need to write a book about this. So we decided to embark on that so we could inspire others to know that you could eat this like beautiful, amazing, 
delicious food and still heal. So we kind of broke it down step by step as a, our intention was a roadmap that like people could crawl into bed with and be like, I can do this and get inspired to do it. So that was my long story, but that's mm-hmm. how we ended up there. And then kind of kept going after that. And just after, after the cookbook, I really just saw the, you know, people were healing. And, um, and so then I just continued on. And then from there I became a lunch lady at my kid's school. And that's, where I am now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you touched on uh, several important points. Yeah. One is that if the mom has a, a, an imbalance in the gut microbiome, they actually pass it on to their kids through the birth canal. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, the, yeah, and the kids can have an imbalance as well. And I think I was one of those people because I would, uh, as a baby, I had eczema. As you know, growing up, I had eczema. And then in college, I had severe acne. So that my gut was never imbalanced until I took it seriously last year after suffering from debilitating eczema. And Mm -hmm. I discovered why food is the ultimate medicine and helping to heal the gut and helping to repopulate those healthy bacteria, not only in the gut, but on the skin. So now I create content for all the world to understand that the gut microbiome is so, so important for health. And look at your skin, it's glowing. Isn't it the best when you're like, oh my gosh, like people will comment on my skin and I'm like, that means so much to me because as somebody who's like always picked at their skin and just like been embarrassed about it, it's like, oh my God, I actually have pretty good skin, you know? So yeah. it looks great. And it's just, it's, I think that sometimes we have our lessons and there's some of us that are the kind of like the chosen ones that feel really compelled to share our stories to, to help other people. So thank you for, for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I think it's my life's calling. It's yeah. It's discovered. like a calling, right? You can't not do it. Yeah. But to your point about the, the microbiome and I mean, one of the reasons that I became the lunch lady at my kids' school is that I feel so passionate about getting to the kids as young as possible and setting them up with a foundation of health and a feeling of what you know it feels like to feel good so that they understand wow like I'm not going you know my blood sugar is not bouncing up and down all day long and I'm not bloated and I'm having regular bowel movements and or whatever I have more energy and so that they and that they understand especially the high schoolers that they understand that they have an opportunity to rebalance before they even consider getting pregnant right so it's almost like just a a re-education of, you know, our ancestors used to do that. They had preconception diets and then diets during pregnancy. And, you know, they really made sure to pack the nutrition into these mamas and the, you know, the dad's preconception, but um, it was so important and we've lost sight of that. And so not only are our kids totally imbalanced, but then yes, they're giving, um, the, the babies are starting off with, I think when my book came out, it was like 287 toxins in the cord blood. So they're starting off toxic And then they're not inheriting good gut flora or any really, except for the hospital, whatever, if they're C-section, which all of my kids were C-section, and then they get a vaccine day one of life, or then they might have an ear infection and get antibiotics. And it's just like this cycle, or they're not breastfed and they're getting processed formulas and their first foods are processed. And so it's just back to back to back. And we can't expect these kids to to catch up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. getting to them early on is so key and, and, and having them understand the value of having a healthy baby is just like no other, you know, it's just the best. I'm trying to share this message to all the moms out there and it's yeah. right now it's kind of been difficult because I don't know which communities to tap into, but you know, I'm going to make content every single day and hopefully the moms will kind of start talking and word of mouth will spread. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, because my kids have had acne and my daughter really values it more that so the triplets and they um she takes better care of her skin and she's more conscious of it whereas the boys are kind of like I have two boys and a girl and they're just like whatever I don't care and I'm like really like don't you you know but they just are boys I don't know they're just messy and 16 and so um but it's nice to have role models like yourself and that's why like even in my lunch in the in the kitchen like I have a young 30 year old lunch leader who's cooking who's like ripped and takes good care of himself and eats really well and it's like we need role models that will really um speak out about this and inspire kids because the first day of school that i was at my 
my kid's school five years ago, the head of school said, your children need role models other than you. And that's always stuck with me because, you know, I can talk about it till I'm blue in the face, but I'm the mom and they don't really want to hear everything I have to say. So unless it's like to the point where they don't want to deal with it anymore and they're going to take control of it or somebody else says something. And that was what happened with me with the whole fat free thing and basically an eating disorder. My brother's friend had to speak with me and that was my moment of like, oh, maybe I'm not doing everything right, you know, and, but it wasn't going to come from my mom. So it's important to have you know, people like yourself out there speaking about it. Mm -hmm. And do you have a say in organizing the recipes and menus for the school? Yeah, so I'm the head of nutrition services and the head lunch lady. And so I created, I saw, um, I mean, we came to this school in Topanga, that's a nature-based school. And it was, I fell in love with it because the chef, the first day we looked at the school, she was like, oh, well, the kids caught their own fish today. And I really want to roast a whole goat. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like these are my people. And so we went, but then as the school got larger, they outsourced the food and I saw it go kind of downhill. And that's when I really stepped in. And it's just like, this is not in line with a nature-based school. You can't have factory farm meats and be talking about nature connection. So I really kind of pushed my way in as the snack coordinator and then kind of outshined the lunch program, if you will, and just said, you know, this is what the kids could have every day. And so it's truly farm to table. It's the best ingredients. We always say it's like the best restaurant in LA because there's just no compromise. There's no, a lot of restaurants have really beautiful ingredients and then they use really bad vegetable oils. And so it's like, you know, what's the point of that? If you're going to go to all the trouble to get beautiful ingredients, don't put, what people don't know also, you know, so and everything comes down to cost. And so we're, I'm trying to really work on shifting that consciousness around the value of health and prevention. And, um, you know, when you are struggling with a disease and we've had our fair share in my family, we have, you know, epilepsy, we have eczema, infertility. My ex-husband had uh, throat cancer. My dad had Alzheimer's. And it's just like, you just spend all your time and all your money chasing health. And so to really have that, I don't know how we get into the human psyche of like waking people up before you have to wake up. Um, and that's what's kind of happening now with the quarantine. It's like a, kind of this beautiful wake up, hopefully is happening with a lot of people, but it was forced, right? So, but it's, it's one of the, the good things I think that will come out of this whole thing. So I don't know um, the answer necessarily, except to just try and keep showing up like you and inspiring people and the people that are ready to hear it will gravitate to it. Yeah. And I, I mean, personally, I thought I was healthy until my crazy eczema flare up happened last year and it was it was due to sausage pizza and then it got worse by drinking tea every day and i found out that i'm sensitive to tea wow so I, was well, drink, I was drinking tea thinking it was anti-inflammatory which it is for most people but for my body it was actually super reactive so yeah, until so. until something very drastic happens and it blindsides you and then people don't really take optimizing health seriously. Yeah. And because that happened to me, I'm like super obsessed with my health and longevity. And I want to help others kind of get into that same mindset. Yeah. And I think stress too, often people will look back and have a stressful moment. We'll just trigger, we'll just flip it over the edge. You know, they'd be like adding on layers of of inflammation and then all of a sudden there's something like, you know, your dad dies or whatever it is and all of a sudden, boom, an autoimmune disease or a flare up of your eczema or something. So um, it's really important, I think, for people to understand too, like you said, with the tea, it's like, I wish there was a one size fits all magic bullet that would just be the right way for everybody. But unfortunately, there's layers of disease and everyone's microbiomes are so different. And so we can't expect that, you know, one, there's one answer for everybody. And that's where I think the future is really tuning in to really listen to what's, what's your body asking for and what's really not working. I mean, don't, and don't sugarcoat it like, Oh, I kind of feel okay. Or it's okay that I didn't poop for three days. And, you know, like just trying to dial into what, what's natural, you know, what, and then just going back to real food alone and being truthful with yourself about that. It's okay to have, you know, somewhat of a balance, but really to try and be, ultimately as as wholesome as you can mm -hmm. unfortunately yeah. we only have one one body and it's um it's no fun when you're not healthy 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I worked with a special lab to determine my food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's listening or watching and they want that contact, please email me at healthyskincoach at gmail.com. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you make a great point because when I started flaring up, uh, my phone, wallet, credit cards, IDs were stolen at a concert. And all that stress just elevated the inflammation inside my body. And yeah, then that's when I noticed my flare. Yeah. A lot of people don't think about that. And then they go back and they're retracing their steps like, oh yeah, there was that thing that happened. We actually work with a, um, with a brand called Jovial Brands, which is um, a woman who, she, she's American, but she married an Italian man and they lived in Italy and had a couple of kids. And one of the daughters was like highly allergic to any wheat. She just couldn't handle even in Italy. And so the, they were already had, they already had BioNature, which is a tomato sauce and a pasta company. And um, so they dove down the rabbit hole of like what they could find. They knew there had to be something. And she found einkorn wheat, which is the most ancient grain. So she started growing that and her daughter's totally fine with that because it has a weaker gluten and they don't refine it as much as, you know, all the other processed stuff. So, you know, I think a lot of people who have gluten intolerance can handle a properly made sourdough, but a lot of sourdough bread is cut with all purpose flour, most of it. So that's why I think ours is really special because it's just 100% whole grain. Mm -hmm. The uh, scientist, um, Dr. Fasano, found that the zonulin proteins in wheat actually causes the leakiness of the gut and damages the intestinal lining. And that's why uh, it causes leaky um, a leaky gut and more inflammation whenever you eat wheat products. Yeah, do you listen to Dr. Tom O'Brien? Mm, no. And he was one of the first gluten people that I listened to several years ago, but he was saying even like they removed gluten out of these, these study cohort um, out of their diets and then like one woman and everyone was healing and then one woman was still not healing and then she's like, but I've removed everything and then it turned out that she was a plain clothed nun and so she was taking her wafer every day for communion or whatever and just it's like one sixteenth of a size of your fingernail was the amount of gluten she was getting but just by removing that then she healed wow so for some people you know it just really is a is a problem so and i mean i, I mean i used to eat all the gluten products right uh <laughs> And, uh, but now I really have no desire to go back. Once you, once you have, heal. yeah, once you heal and have clear skin, then mentally you just have, you're not really tempted at all. Yeah. But yeah. most, yeah. Some of my clients are like, oh, I want to have cheat days and all that, but then they have bad skin. So I, I, I tell them, okay, you eat this food and probably three or four days after you're gonna have you're gonna see it in your skin and it's gonna take a month or longer to heal since fresh new skin comes out once a month. Right. So if you think like that, then yeah, you might not be tempted to right. eat. It. Yeah, because it's like two steps forward, five steps back, you know, it's just like it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. yeah. What has been some of your most uh, memorable client stories? Well, I don't typically I don't really work with um, clients one-on-one, -on -one. but, um, I mean, I've had just even in being the lunch lady, people who, um, just, they just have these awakenings of like, oh my gosh, like I'm not even hungry for dinner or I'm not bloated or I have way more energy or my child seems so much more vibrant. Actually, there was a mom at the school whose son had somewhat of like failure to thrive, just sort of burping all the time and kind of pasty faced and not really like vibrant. He was maybe seven and she started him on the GAPS diet and he just like within months just totally lit up. His eyes were clear and, um, and she's been really, and it was actually great because I'm his lunch lady. So for a mom to be able to send your child to school and know that, you know, somebody who totally understands gut health and GAPS and what you're doing um, on a daily basis to try and heal your child is like going to be followed through at school. So nice. So that's always so nice to see kids. I mean, I had another kid who had colitis and then, um, or maybe it was Crohn's. I can't remember which one, but I like, you know, major IBS and then did the gap side just for a summer and healed incredibly. And then I've been feeding him for like four years and he just went on an expedition 
for like one semester and he said, Hillary, all my allergies came flying back. He's like, we were even making our own bread and everything, but he's, I said, well, it was probably all processed, refined flour, right? And so everything, so, but that was his moment of like, huh, you know, like my body totally responded to those foods in a different way. Or I've had actually his brother, his twin brother, we had a, a study where we had people where we had chefs, parents, students, and staff wear these continuous blood glucose monitors. So you can see how food directly affects your blood glucose levels, um, which is so huge because so many are obese and have diabetes and you know chronic disease. And so um, one this brother was wearing, he's a junior, and he said he ate like a beautiful BLT for lunch with you know, good mayonnaise and bacon and lettuce, tomato, or sourdough. And his blood glucose was totally even. And then he went home and ate six gummy bears or gummy worms and upshot his blood glucose and then a big crash afterwards. And so just six gummy worms. Like you wouldn't, as a teenager, think that's a big deal. But then, and it's not to say he's never going to eat another gummy worm again, but he at least has this awareness. So it's a really nice empowerment tool for these kids and, and especially for chefs to wear who are feeding children or feeding anybody for that matter, because once you understand what you're eating and how it's affecting your health and your blood glucose levels, then you have a certain accountability as to how you're feeding your children. So for parents too, you know, if they're buying all processed snacky foods that the kids love, but then you see what it's doing to them all day, you kind of have to switch your mindset. Mm -hmm, definitely. Uh, what are some of the favorite meals for the students? Oh gosh. Well, you know, they love like even a homemade mac and cheese with our beautiful like raw dairy and all that stuff in our um, jovial pasta. They love, they do like, I think all kids, you know, are so used to having so many carbohydrates that they gravitate to stuff like that. But we make um, like homemade enchiladas and we make chicken thighs. We make hamburgers that are grass fed meat and, um, they, I'm trying to think, it's been so weird because I haven't been in the kitchen for a while since um, pasta bolognese. So, and we get like really great ingredients, right? So we're able to get so much nutrient dense ingredients into them. Um, we do like a soup salad focaccia day um, every week. So they have like the einkorn focaccia bread, uh, sourdough, and what else? We do slow roasted meat. So we would like pulled pork and shredded chuck roll. We've done brisket before, which they love. So yeah, they're pretty like, you know, they, they start to realize that this is really a treat. I think, I mean, some of them might take it for granted and some of them don't, you know, some of them still bring their own lunch, very few, but I'm like, why as a parent would you not be like, you're, I'm sorry, you're going to eat the school lunch. This is like the most nutrient dense food you can find. But um, for the most part, they're very grateful and they understand, you know, we get all, it's very um, lush with local vegetables and we do all of our own like sprouted nuts and we soak all of our grains and legumes. And so everything's as digestible and absorbable as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm getting hungry just you <laughs> listing, listing all those foods. Uh, what are some of your favorite recipes in your cookbook? Oh gosh. Um, hmm. Well, I love the chicken thigh recipe because I think it's super easy where you just put the chicken thighs with like, you can put leeks and mushrooms, whatever underneath them, and then put a little water in it and then you bake it. And so then it creates this really yummy gelatinous broth that is so good with the mushrooms. Um, I love the um, butternut squash Swiss chard lasagna. That's a total winner with sausage in there. And I always love just a plain roasted chicken that can be, I always think like for parents, if they're going to learn one thing, it's like learn how to roast a chicken and then turn that into several meals and then a bone broth where you can add that to soups and um, or just drink on its own. It's so good for the skin, right? The hair, the skin, the nails, digestion. Uh, I recommend to clients a uh, chicken soup with the skin and cartilage and bone inside because there's a bunch of collagen in, in the skin and the bones, that's really great for healing the gut and for the yeah. skin, since majority of the skin is collagen. Yeah, and, I just posted uh, last night, like I made chickens and pulled them and, um, and I love the little, the wing, cause I love to chew on the end of the bone. And I put on my Instagram, like our ancestors used to really like chew on the ends of bones 
because they knew that was like filled with all that gelatin and collagen. And um, so, yeah, there's lots. And when I, when we were doing the GAPS diet, I would pick off every single gelatinous piece of anything and put it into our soups and everything. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I mean, most people throw the bones away, but if I could just blend up the bones and put in wa water and chug it, like that's so much collagen. That's yeah. great. And put, like I put heads, chicken heads and chicken feet. Um, turkey necks, whatever I can get into my broth to, I mean, people are, it took me like a year to put chicken feet in and then like another year to put the heads in. But once you realize like the power of that nutrition, then it's like, and then I said, like last night I said on my Instagram, like you honor the animal really by using the whole animal, right? It means there is a process that has happened that we're so disconnected from, you know, it doesn't just show up on the grocery store shelves, like a boneless, skinless chicken breast, like an animal died. And, you know, to waste some of the most nutrient parts of it is, or nutrient dense parts is such a shame. And so I think we need to really understand that. And then it's much more economical too, right? You're getting so much more out of using the whole bird, mm -hmm, both mm -hmm. nutritionally and economically. Definitely. What are some advice that you can give up and coming moms? Ooh, I was just gonna talk about this today. I was, I really feel passionately, especially since, um, with our current situation that I was reflecting on when I was a young mom and it's so terrifying and so, on so many levels. Like I remember my child getting a, an ear infection. I was like, ah, and like immediately just put him on antibiotics. Cause I was like, okay, I got to do whatever the doctor says. And then another, and then this naturopath that I was also going to said, you know, you don't have to put them on antibiotics. They most likely will just work its way out. And, um, and I was like, really? And then the next thing I know, like my eczema baby's eardrum burst and there was like stuff oozing out of it. And I was like, oh my gosh. And like, boom, like threw them on antibiotics. So they didn't know. And then the naturopath was like, you didn't have to panic and like, and do that. Like, they're not going to die. They're resilient. And so the watchful waiting is, is super important, but also to ask a lot of questions just inform yourself as much as you can. When I was a young mom, I didn't know anything. And so I just did whatever. I think doctors have good intentions, but I think you ultimately have to be your own, your own doctor in some ways, or your own, you have to listen to your intuition. And as a mama, you know, you know, you can look at your baby and, and just also know that that is like this little miracle that's so precious. And so everything that you put into that baby is, affecting them on a cellular level, right? Not to give you more stress, but to just really return to what you know to be good and true and from mother nature and research on like how our ancestors ate. I mean, I think Nourishing Traditions is one of the best books that any mother could or before conception get and read about cultures from around the world and how they ate and how they um, prioritized diet and lifestyle. It's not just about diet, but I would say as a, for moms to really just get comfortable with tuning into your own intuition, not panicking, and also um, asking a lot of questions and doing a lot of research and ultimately knowing that you are an individual, like bio-individuality, your child is different from you, is different from your other child, different from your neighbor. And so, you know, just empowering yourself. Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. And the body wants to be in homeostasis. So it wants to be, you know, thriving. So it really will work really hard when given the right tools to get back to that. But I like to give an example of like, when my husband had cancer, it was like, or even the eczema, like you can't just, there's a reason why you got it, right? I don't think everything is just bad luck. Like there's something going on inside that's not, that's out of balance. So you can like throw all the drugs at it or the organic food or whatever you want. I mean, food is medicine, but you ultimately have to, like I think of a fish tank, like you imagine a fish in a clean tank and they're all happy and you feed it and it poops and you feed it and it poops and it starts to get murky and the fish starts to slow down and you can like be giving it like organic food and drugs or whatever to supplements to help it survive. But if you don't clean the tank, the fish isn't going to get better. So you really have to look at it as this whole, like, you know, the microbiome is this lush terrain that you really have to work to find that, that balance. And it's, there are a lot of factors that come into play from stress to lifestyle to food. And um, 
So, but knowing that I think the body wants to heal from anything and that it can heal from anything to be persistent. It doesn't just like you got there over time, you have to take your time to get back. It's not going to happen overnight. There unfortunately are no quick fixes really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I always say inflammation is acquired and your body wants to heal itself, but you have to provide it, provide it the right source of fuel. And most people are misinformed or uninformed on what that fuel is. And so they keep eating inflammatory foods that is doing damage short-term and long-term. And so I'm right now super obsessed with inflammatory biomarkers and how that increases whenever we eat foods. So I'm like diving deep into cytokines and histamines and leukotrienes and prostaglandins and all these chemicals that are released when we eat food and how how we can reduce those amounts using food and uh, you know lifestyle choices and exercising and all that yeah and there's so much and i think also um one bit of advice i would give is that there's so much information out there that you can become especially if you're like a type a like i'm a little bit type a sometimes just like get really rigid about things and like this is the way and and you can offend a lot of people too by being in your little box of like what you're going to do and ultimately you have to be comfortable with like this is what's working for me and my body and if you don't like it then sorry but i think there's also um a point where people can lose the enjoyment of connection and community and you know quote unquote breaking bread together because of that rigidity and i get when people have to heal they have to be rigid but also i think to let some of it go. Um, it doesn't mean go, you know, have McDonald's because your neighbor wants to go do that. But like, if somebody invites you into their home and they serve a beautiful meal to not be so like, ah, I can't eat that. That's going to screw up my whole body. Like, just know that your body is resilient and to almost bless it and eat it and enjoy your company is better than freaking out about it and imagining it's like destroying everything in you that you, you know, so um, again, if you're healing and you're on a strict protocol, then yes, you have a, you know, reason why you cannot do that. But um, I think, like, I had somebody here, uh, like, who's in his 20s, who was a friend of a friend, came for dinner, and all of a sudden I'm making, like, shrimp and bacon, and then all of a sudden she's like, oh my gosh, do you have any dietary restrictions? And he's like, well, actually, I'm mostly vegan, and um, but, and I was just like, ah, and then all of a sudden he said, but you know, but I'll eat whatever you serve me. So he really just like, it's like, that's such a breath of fresh air. He was really willing to just kind of be grateful. I think gratitude is a huge thing that's missing. We're so fortunate to have a choice. A lot of people don't have a choice as to what they can eat. A lot of people in other countries, you know, right now I feel like there's such a divide with like, I'm going to be vegan. I'm a vegetarian. How dare you eat meat? It's like some people can only eat meat. They don't, they can't grow anything, you know, in their countries or wherever they're living. So I think to just be in gratitude for the fact that we have a choice and we have so much, for the most part, we, we have access to, um, to beautiful foods. So, but it's important that people also realize that we have to support those farmers that are doing things right in order to maintain this access. And our topsoil is, we have 60 years of topsoil left before it's completely destroyed. So 60 harvests left before our topsoil is destroyed. And then when that happens, we're really in trouble. You know, that's like foundation of everything. And we're not going to be able to grow anything. So it's super important that people understand that you vote with your dollar and that you're you're doing the best thing for your health and for the health of the planet and for the future generations. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, hundred percent agree. I went to the grocery store and everything sold out except the vegetables. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. In order yeah. to boost your immune system to fight off the coronavirus, but most people just want the dry foods, which have no nutrients. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so interesting. I think this is an opportunity. I was speaking about this the other day too. It's an opportunity for habit change. Like my, I was talking to somebody the other day who was just like, you know, what do you think of the eat right for your blood type diet? I've been eating rye bread and my, I've lost 17 pounds. I'm like, well, I don't know that I would give all the credit to like switching your bread, but you know, what else have you been doing? And he's like, well, I have been walking an hour a day and I haven't really been to the grocery store in like five weeks. So, you know, he doesn't have access to as much food. He used to eat out all the time. He's spending more time with his wife and having these important conversations. And so it's like a lifestyle 
shift and his awareness is now like, wow, I really did. And he has diabetes, high blood pressure and obesity. So, you know, for that, those types of things to be happening is so great to see people, but I just hope they give the credit to the, you know, not what's not really usually one thing that creates yeah. that shift. Yeah. It, it definitely is a lifestyle change in order to be healthy from within and from everything you're doing in, in terms of managing stress and working out as a country. I think Americans are almost too blessed because we have access to food everywhere yeah. and we've kind of forgotten to eat only when we're hungry yeah. and uh, we're just constantly snacking. It's, it's not activating autophagy within our system, which can only be activated through fasting and yeah. you got to recycle the dead proteins and cells inside. And that's part of the anti-aging process that will help you live longer. But yeah. uh, most people I'm just- I'm a big fan of that. Just Even just shortening your window of when you eat is so huge because it just gives, your body has to, like I have another friend who eats at like 10, 10 30 at night. I'm like, what the heck? And your body can't do any, like when you're sleeping is when you repair, right? So when you're, and you know this, but when you're spending, your entire sleeping time trying your body has to digest before it does anything else so if it's digesting all night long it's not in that repair state in that restful state so uh it's so important to to give your body a rest and um yeah we and if you eat nutrient dense foods like a lot of people have commented like do you guys even eat dessert and i'm like yeah, we do sometimes but we don't crave it like if it's in the house for sure my kids are just like do we have any chocolate where's that pie you know but if we don't have it, then those cravings really aren't there. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. And you know, you know, when you have sugar so addictive and um, easy to want more of. So it's just like, it's again, it's making a choice of what you want to have access to. Um, and if it's all really wholesome ingredients, you can't go too wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I've pretty much given up sugar just because of my skin. But when I eat blueberries, which is my favorite fruit, even yeah. that sugar is just like, mmm, gotta have more and more. Yeah, <laughs> it's so addictive. That I dopamine. Know. Well, and it's like, that's what people don't, some people are like, oh, well, my kid, they don't really like vegetables, but they eat a ton of fruit. So like, that's okay. But I'm like, well, that's still breaking down to sugar in the body. So to understand to eat like, you know, 20 orange slices is just not you know, that's not the way to go. Mm -hmm. So um, again, most people only had access to fruit seasonally and, um, and maybe they, yeah, maybe they had a lot of blueberries when they were in season, but it was short lived and, and then it was over. And that's where we really also have so much access to stuff that we, we don't value it when it comes in season as much, you know, if we were to return back to really eating seasonally, it would be, it truly would be a treat, right? To have those blueberries one season a year uh yeah this has been awesome where can the listeners and viewers find you so i'm on um well we're in the process of rebranding right now but I'm a lot of exciting things happening so but right now the best place is on instagram at live yum yum l-i-v-e-y-u-m y-u-m and i'm live in my kitchen pretty much every day um just my my whole thought behind this quarantine time was like, you know, what can I do to be of service? And I really thought if I can just open my heart and open my home and show people how we cook traditional foods. And I have five kids. So um, to be able to just get nutrient dense meals on the table, it's just not complicated, right? It's just getting your systems up and running and valuing the proper foods and, um, and then just how you kind of do it. So I'm live and uh, just inspiring people as much as I can every day to return to real food. Got it. To the trillions of listeners out there, go like all her social media profiles. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining the podcast. Please stay safe and please stay healthy. As always, Taco is out. <laughs>